I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, John A. List. John is the Kenneth C. Griffin Distinguished Service Professor in Economics at the University of Chicago. His research focuses on combining field experiments with economic theory to deepen our understanding of the economic science. In the early 1990s, John pioneered field experiments as a methodology for testing behavior theories and learning about behavior principles that are shared across different domains. His research includes over 200 peer-reviewed journal articles and several published textbooks. He co-authored the international bestseller, The Y-Axis, in 2013, and is author to a new book, The Voltage Effect, released in early 2022. He is the current editor of the Journal of Political Economy. John, over to you. Hey, everyone. I hope you're having a good conference. Um, I'm John, and I'm a professor of economics at the University of Chicago, and I'm also the chief economist at Walmart. Today, what I want to talk about is the complementarities between AI and behavioral economics. I'm going to call this the this chief economist, yin and yang. Where I'm going to start is back when I was the chief economist at Uber, we had a project that I called Uber Apologies, which is kind of a good example of going from ML to field experiment to ML. Now, fast forward from Uber, I joined Lyft, and there was really an interesting example of Lyft in thinking about pricing and wait times that will take us from ML to field experiment to ML-driven new products. So that's going to be example number two today. Example number three, of course, I have to talk about scaling. And I'm going to summarize some thoughts on machine learning and scale. And I call this the high voltage story. This is after my recent textbook or popular book, let's call it, uh, The Voltage Effect. So in total, as we go through these examples, I want you in the back of your mind to be thinking about, well, how is this different than the other presentations that have taken place at the conference? And I think one key difference is I'm looking at AI and scaling and product through the lens of economics. And when we do that, what will we draw out is there are various tools or resources that we can use and we can learn some deep and foundational insights about both causal inference and correlations. So number one is going to be effect identification. That's going to be a common economic use of ML. Number two will be an architectural nudge. And number three will be detection of heterogeneity. These are going to be three typical examples that we commonly use when we work with organizations. Okay, so let's start with example number one, the economics of apologies. Now, there's an entire backstory of the economics of apologies, and I don't have time to tell you that story today. I would urge you, if you like to listen to podcasts, there's a Freakonomics podcast on economics of apologies where I tell the whole backstory about what happened. Basically, what happened was I had a bad trip on Uber, and after having a bad trip, I gave Travis Kalanick, who was the CEO at the time, he's one of the co-founders of Uber, I gave him a telephone call. And I let him know what I thought about his Uber app. And I told him I'm never going to use Uber again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end, I said, and I'd never even received an apology. And Travis said, well, John, we haven't gotten to that yet. And I said, well, we have now. So when you have an idea like this, of course, in a firm, you want to make the business case. So... What I did essentially was I started to look at large data sets within Uber and I started to look for statistical twins. 
Now, what I mean by that is you have two riders who are otherwise identical, and here I'm calling them Sally and Jane, and you look at some observables and say, well, they look identical. They both take this particular trip at around 1.15 to 1.30 on Wednesday afternoon, and what happens is Sally arrives early and Jane arrives 20 minutes late. So it looks like it's all else equal and something bad happened because as an experimentalist, I don't want to randomize bad trips over people. I want to look in the data to see, can I find a statistical twin where one gets a good trip and one gets a bad trip? And then what I want to do is I want to look at, for example, their consumption or their use of Uber over the next 90 days. Now, in this particular example, Sally got a good trip. Business as usual, she takes five Uber rides in the next 90 days, spends $115. On the right here, Jane receives a bad trip. She says, to heck with it. I'm not going to use Uber anymore. So this is one kind of treatment effect. So what we did, of course, is we can't just look at Sally and Jane. We need to aggregate over thousands and hundreds of thousands of such pairs and use ML to figure out what is the cost of a bad trip. Now, in the end, we estimated that these types of bad trips, delivering customers late to their destination, there are a lot of different types of bad trips, of course, but I'm just focusing on delivering people late. What you can see here is in Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, and Dallas, it's between 5 and 10% of lost revenues over the next 90 days. So we have the use case. Bad trips cost Uber a lot of money in terms of future revenues. So now you ask, well, can we attenuate that negative effect? So what we do, what an economist would typically do, is start with theory and then design a field experiment. And from there, you want to define and refine the product using ML. So I won't go into the experiment, but essentially what it was, was a series of different kinds of apologies which were crossed or interacted with a promotion of, say, $5 off your next trip. So essentially we had a basic apology that read as follows, and you can see it over here. These are emails that people receive, and they receive these emails within one hour of a bad trip. We found that it's very important to send the email very quickly after a bad trip. So the basic apology, oh no, your trip took longer. What can we do? Here's $5 off your next trip, we're sorry. And then we have something called a status apology, which our theory predicts might have a different type of effect. And then we cross that with promotional dollars and some without promotional dollars. And then of course we have the commitment apology. We can do better. You deserve better. This time we missed, but we're committed to giving you good arrival times and good service in the future. Okay, so that was a simple experiment that we ran at Uber. Now, in the end, what you find is that these kinds of treatments work. So this is just a glimpse of within seven days of the promo and apology. Here's the control group. These are after these people received a bad trip, this is how much money they spent in the next seven days. And as you can see, we have a lift with just apology, just promo, and promo and apology. So you can see we're, we're getting back about 1% or 2%, which is not so bad from a, a simple uh, promotional exercise. And then if you look at out 90 days or more, we, of course, also have lift. Now you can explore heterogeneity. Are there certain passenger types that are more or less affected by the apology treatments. And I've just given you one cut of the data. It, it, it really jumps out in the just promo data and the promo and apology that the green and the orange, these are new users or very light users. So you can see the treatment effect really works uh, a lot. It's a lot more effective in a way with these light users or these new users. Okay, so that's a bit of heterogeneity that's important. So in this first example, the ML scoreboard would say, okay, they used ML to 
identify any fact. They then used ML as an architectural nudge. They looked at all kinds of different ways to format the email and the wording, etc. And then they used ML for heterogeneity detection. So these, these are three common ways that economists think about using ML to improve the bottom line and make the world a better place. Okay, what about example number two, the value of time? Now, this one did not start as a business use case, but it more started with, let's say, out of scientific or policy interest. And what I mean by that is when you look at value of time in the U.S. government case, we, of course, always want to do benefit cost analysis. And when you do benefit cost analysis for new projects or new programs, many of them involve time or in some cases, savings of time. When you think about a bridge or, or an HOV lane, etc. Right now, the U.S. government typically attaches a time of between a third and a half of the wage rate for a project appraisal. And what that means is it's about $9 to $14 per hour. So when you think about that, well, when the U.S. government is considering climate taxes or congestion or pricing or public transit, that's the dollar value that they are attaching to the benefit side. So the question is, is that number correct? Or can we do better with a partnership inside of a firm to get better estimates of that particular value of time number? So what we did, of course, is we start thinking about Lyft. Now, at the time, ML at Lyft was recognizing this reduced form relationship between conversion. Conversion means you take out your Lyft app and you ask for a price quote and a time quote, and then you decide whether to take the trip or not. That's conversion. So the machine was recognizing the relationship between ETAs, price, and conversion. Okay, that's fine. Dispatch then is using certain incentives on both sides of the market to make use of that information. Now, along comes the economist who said, well, look, field experiments have an opportunity to measure exogenous variation in ETAs and prices rather than endogenous variation. When you have exogenous variation, you can make strong causal statements. When it's endogenous, you have to make extra assumptions, very difficult. So we want to come in and say, okay, if we have experimental variation on ETAs and prices, we can not only think about new products, but we can also think about a value of time estimate. So what did we do? Um, at, at Lyft, what we did is we randomly changed the wait time in the price of a ride that customers eyeballed, typically you receive the closest car to you. In this particular experiment, you randomly either receive the first, second, or third closest to you. And then, of course, we give a take it or leave it price in ETA. And here's where the economic theory comes in. If you assume weak complementarity in extensive margin choices, now I just need two elasticities to estimate a value of time. The two elasticities I need is the elasticity of demand or the price elasticity of demand, how sensitive are people to price changes, and then I need the wait time elasticity, how sensitive are people to variation in the wait times. So I run that experiment with a, with a group at Lyft, and we estimate a value of time which is much larger than current U.S. federal guidelines. We estimate a value of time of 1940. Now, there's actually a lot of heterogeneity that is consistent with changing marginal costs and benefits. So what I mean by that is there, there's a higher value of time in peak commuting times, in higher income areas, in locations with more outside options, for those that are ride sharing for business, all of these types have a higher value of time. Now, we also find that value of time increases over longer periods of wait time. There's a convex relationship. Okay. Now, what are some products that might come from this? Well, you might have heard of wait and save. You might have heard of walk and save. You might have heard of fast pass. 
Now, all of these came from the original experiments that Lyft ran, the, the people at Lyft set up and ran. And then you use field experiments to test those product variants and you use ML to refine them. Now, these are just some nibbles, some two examples. You can think of many, many other areas where you can combine economics and machine learning to learn about the world. Gender pay gap, we've done that. What is the gender pay gap for Uber drivers? Optimal pricing algos, loyalty programs. What about bundles and discounts? How should we think about those? Employee productivity. Here I'm, I'm not only talking about the types of employees, but also the interaction of employees with capital. And what does new technology do to the productivity of your employees? Now, you can think about workplace features as well, which is opening up an entire uh, beautiful world that has a lot of low-hanging fruit. You can think about optimal worker incentive schemes, worker malfeasance, wellness programs, uh, disclosure rules, uncertainty, monitoring. The list just goes on and on of where we can take a, a standard ML approach and use standard behavioral economics or standard economics, and you can put them together and really make a difference in terms of using science to learn. Let's go to letter C. Well, what about scaling of ideas? And we're all interested in scaling, of course. We all have an idea that works in the Petri dish, and we're interested in what are the prospects of that idea of scaling from the Petri dish to the large. This type of consideration has been really common throughout my career. For example, I worked in the White House 20 years ago as an advisor to President Bush, and we talked about a lot of different policies, and each time it had the flavor of, well, it works in New Jersey, will it work in Atlanta? That's called horizontal scaling. Or it worked once in New Jersey, what if we wanted to scale it up in New Jersey? That's called vertical scaling. These are issues that would commonly come up when we would have policymaking ideas. Now, in my private life, I, I was a chief economist at Uber and then Lyft and now Walmart. We are constantly discussing scaling, as, as you might imagine. Now, I oftentimes think about, well, what about the other venues in the, in the nonprofits I've worked for? Smile Train, United Way, Sierra Club, Philadelphia Boys Choir. In each case, scaling has always been at least in the background, if not one of the most important variables that we considered when thinking about ideas. So when I first started doing scientific research on scaling, I started looking around at what was our understanding of scaling? And I started talking to experts and I started hearing things like move fast and break things, fake it till you make it, throw spaghetti against the wall, whatever sticks, cook it. So I started to think, well, these, this is interesting art and interesting in terms of gut feelings, but what about science? And this is kind of what I, include, what I concluded was the science of scaling has been a, a bit like this cartoon where you have a bunch of elegant math and then a miracle occurs and then you have more elegant math. Now, as a professor, I think about exactly what this fellow's saying. I think we should be a bit more explicit in step two, in the scaling step. And that's what we have not been entirely scientific about in thinking about scaling. So that's where my new book comes in. So I've recently written a book called The Voltage Effect. And the book is, the first part of the book talks about what it, what's the DNA or what are the elements of an idea that is actually scalable? What, what do those elements look like? Or what's the DNA for scaling? And then the second part talks about four simple behavioral economic secrets to after you try to scale an idea to execution, okay? Now, from the book, since we want to be scientists about this, we can talk about laws of scaling. 
So in the book, I introduce what I call the first law of scaling. That's the voltage effect. When you first do an intervention in the small, the effect sizes will change every time when you move from the small to the big. Okay, that's the way I think about the voltage effect. Now, I probably have some engineers listening in. I want to give you an analogy because I totally understand this should be wattage effect. I get that. Um, I want you to think about the analogy of the voltage effect being it's the scaling up. It's the higher voltage that enables ideas to move to many people in many different locations. Okay, that's what I would call the first law of scaling. And I understand social scientists, we have qualitative laws. We don't have quantitative laws like the hard sciences have. The second law of scaling is a lot of times people think an idea has to have a silver bullet. The second law of scaling is basically saying it's not a silver bullet problem. It's an Anna Karenina problem. Scalable ideas are all alike. Each unscalable idea is unscalable in its own way. But the book talks about the five vital signs that an idea has to have for us to have scaling confidence. And those five vital signs are contained here. They're false positives, population, is it the chef or is it the ingredients, spillovers. So numbers one, two, three, and four here in our ocular depiction of the five vital signs, these are all on the demand side. And then the fifth one is the supply side of scaling. So this is essentially the first five chapters of the voltage effect. And it details what are the features of your idea that you want to have in place before you even think about scaling. So scaling epilogue. ML, as I, as I pinpoint in, in my new book and in my, my larger body of work, it really helps us to identify those five vital signs that I just talked about. But interestingly, advances in AI have a real unique opportunity to open up new avenues. And what I mean by that is, one example is, think about previous ideas that were discarded, maybe because of technological constraints or, or financial constraints. These ideas that at once have been discarded might now be scalable because of the new innovations that have happened in the last five or 10 years around ML and AI. That's the product space or the idea space. You can also think about locations. Some locations want to be Silicon Valley and in the past they really had no chance. But now with innovations on the tech side and work from home and a, and a lot of the other improvements that we've seen, these types of locations that were at once deemed really non-players. They could actually be considered and considered in a big way because once you have a start, economists call it agglomeration economies, more and more firms will want to enter because they can absorb all the good stuff or the good spillovers that happen between firms, whether it's Marshall Aero Romer economies or Jane Jacob externalities. These are all externalities that firms that locate near each other can reap. Now, again, once the idea is scaled, now we can think about using ML and behavioral economics as complements and execution. And I've given you just a few examples about, you know, you have a treatment effect and ML helps you to identify it. You might want to do some architectural nudging. You might want to detect heterogeneity. These are all important elements. And th this list, by any means, is not exhaustive. You could think about using ML for mediation paths, for example. So there are many ways that once you combine a little bit of economic theory, maybe some behavioral economics, with field experiments and ML, it really opens up an entirely new path of scientific inquiry that not only, of course, can help the firm, but as I showed you in the VOT case, can also give advice to policymakers and attempt to make policymaking more efficient. And of course, it can improve consumers' lives as well. 
Okay, so there you have it. I want to thank you for your attention. Thanks for tuning in. And let me know how I did, not only with this lecture, but with my new book, The Voltage Effect. And Alex, thank you so much for having me. And look forward to seeing you soon. Everyone have a great conference. 